Kanye West is well known for a lot of things. He's one of the most successful artists of all time, a musical innovator, a top tier fashion designer, owner of a billion dollar company, and one of the most famous people in the world. How much more successful do you want me to be? More successful. But maybe Kanye's most admirable trait is his ability to bring the most talented people together into one room and create the highest level of product possible. And there's no field he's shown that skill off in more than music. My greatest pain in life is I will never be able to see me perform. For most artists, working with someone of Kanye West's creative stature is a dream come true. Being able to watch Ye work, learn from him, and contribute to some of the most well-received projects in musical history is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Even early on in his career, though, Kanye was impressing legends like Pharrell with impromptu studio performances. I can't complain with the action it did to my left eye. Look what the action it did to left eye. First Aaliyah, now Romeo must die. I know I got angels watching me from the other side. <laughs> or playing beats for Jay-Z that had him looking like a meme before memes even existed. But as Kanye grew in his own career, his studio sessions evolved into an almost mythical process. In this video, we're gonna look at what it's like to be in the studio with Kanye West, straight from the mouths of artists like Nicki Minaj, Pusha T, RZA, Jamie Foxx, and more. Just because Ye's process is unique, that doesn't mean it's always easy to be in the studio with him. I mean, Big Sean recently said it was actually the opposite experience. Kanye will have you redo a verse 10 times, redo a verse 10 times. Redo some drums 10 times. Chance the Rapper might still be having flashbacks from this day. <laughs> and the thing about working with Kanye is that even though it's a timeless experience, your work may never actually see the light of day. A lot of rappers have spoken about doing a bunch of songs with him only to never have them actually come out. Or maybe you recorded a verse that you really liked but it never makes the final cut of the album. Just ask Big Draco. As far as to what we are today, yeah, that's you know, that's, it's why like- you take him off your album? You ain't hear that verse? No. <laughs> he was a girl. <laughs> oh, I get what you're saying. Oh. Hold the fuck up, nigga. I know you ain't trying to hold up, nigga. But Kanye is a perfectionist when it comes to his art. Sean mentioned rewriting verses in that first clip we showed, but that seems like the standard in a Ye studio session. Rick Ross said that Kanye made him rewrite his classic verse for Devil in a New Dress multiple times, but it ended up being unanimously crowned as one of Ross's best verses of his career. Ye even made Pusha T rewrite his Runaway verse four times, and that's Pusha T. Kanye allegedly told King Push that he needed him to be, quote, more douchebag on the record. Here's what he had to say about the song's creation. Push said, I'm writing a verse and I come back to the table and it's something that I'm feeling and he's like, nah, but I need more douchebag. And I'm like, all right, man, come on. So I go back and he's like, nah, more douchebag. He's screaming at me, more douchebag at this point. Thinking about Kanye screaming more douchebag at Pusha T in itself is hilarious, but back to what Pusha was saying. Ye was relentless about making the final product just right. He just pushes you and pushes you and pushes you. With Runaway, I think I wrote that four times. Even Nicki Minaj admitted that Kanye pushed her to write a better version of her now classic monster verse. The verse that many call one of the most important of her career and one of the best of the 2010s altogether. What I remember most about Monster is that Kanye really pushed me to be better. That you know, I wrote a verse to it and he was like, I think you could do better. He's like, murder me on this. Murder me. <laughs> no, but he just was like, I think you could do better. Yeah. And I think you should really think about what you want to say. And I said, wow, I never thought about it like that. And I just wrote down a whole bunch of stuff. And then I created the rap from there. Um, so that's what made me fall in love with Kanye. Because he didn't have to do that. You know, he didn't have to push me to be my best. But he did. And Kanye's creative direction isn't only limited to verses. Ye knows exactly what he wants every hook to sound like as an executive producer. As Nicki said, he wants to bring the best out of everyone. Just listen to Sahai the Prince talk about the recording of the now classic song, All of the Lights. Saxophone, fucking vocals, alto, soprano, antenna. Like, then there are all of the lights. Niggas don't know. It's Elton John, Alicia Keys, Rihanna, uh, Drake. All of them on there. He ain't asking to sing their own verse or their own part. He asked them, could you sing 
a melody for a background. Like they singing, we are the world. You know what I mean? Everybody sing, we are the world. Yeah, got them in there. All the lights. Apparently Alicia Keys was even pregnant while recording those vocals. One of the best Kanye studio stories though comes from Jamie Foxx, who is also one of the best storytellers. And he learned firsthand not to question Ye's melodic direction for a hook. And then one day, throwing this party and all of a sudden this dude walk in with a backpack, jaw a little swollen. Mm -hmm. Kanye, yeah, uh, I have a song uh, I want you to get on. I was like, nigga, what? I got the studio in the back. Word. So we go in the back. And he said a song go, she says she wants some Marvin Gaye, wow. some Luther Vandross. I said, I got it. I got it. She says she wants some Marvin. He said, what you doing? I said, well, you don't know nothing about R&B. So I got to put the R&B shit on the scene. <laughs> and this one we learned about, this one we learned about Kanye. He said, uh, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm Jamie Foxx. He said, yeah, but don't do that. He said, just do the song like, like this. So I did the song. And in my mind, I'm like, this shit is whack. Uh -huh. He's not going to make it. Right? And then I left. I did it. <laughs> I did. I left. I did a bad movie. I came back, <laughs> and when I came back from that, I said, "Yeah, remember that song you was fronting on? It's number one in the country." But all of this comes from Kanye having a clear vision of what he wants from a song, and all of the artists who are involved in that song. John Mayer described it perfectly when asked about working with Kanye. One of the first times I saw him in the studio, he had a, had a laptop in his arm, and he went, "Listen to this," and it was the instrumental of Gold Digger, and he rapped along to it. Perfect. It was perfect. He, I just heard him do stuff. So, so Kanye's thing is that at least when I, I don't want to pretend like I know him super well, but I don't imagine this changes in somebody as a mm, creative. Mm. The, the veil that hangs between what you know and what you don't in terms of creating for him is so frigging thin that I understand his excitement artistically because he can pull anything into existence that he wants. He is the, maybe the greatest summoner of, of, of creative energy so i've just seen him do it it's a magic trick you know who's really good at it too is chance mm. chance is really good at it mm. and sean's really good at it mm. too but kanye's the best at it in terms of sitting in a room with a thing he doesn't have and going and coming back with a thing within seconds he's fearless plus that session delivered us some classic moments like this first the white guy and the black guy must meet and to do that a fumbling must occur between the sequence of events and the handshake to the hug watch what just happened about 15 minutes ago hey what Connie, what's going on oh hey man what's going on start with a pound come on that's good yeah but even though he's a visionary when it comes to creative direction he's also willing to go to experts in their given fields and let them do their thing a perfect example is when he tapped Timbaland just to make the drums knock a little bit harder, better, and faster on Stronger. I'm sorry, that was a really bad pun, but please don't turn off the video. I promise, no more bad jokes for the remainder. I was, I was gonna get Tim to just help me out a little bit with the sonics and the kick. How you gonna tell me this record's not hot? Even though the drums ain't right, I still think I want to get the drums right and get the shit knocking, you know, for the, the step uh, See, my thing is, I, want, I can beef it up right now, and you're going to go crazy. Because I can do a lot in a day. I, don't, I, don't, I have so many sounds, I, it's, it's too much to go through. It hurts to get rid of it. Here he is talking about the creation of Common's B album and how much he learned from being around Common in the studio. Oh, I'm gonna tell you, you shoulda did this, you shoulda uh -huh. did that. So it wasn't just, okay, us going in and making beats, man. Like, this album, working on this album made my life better. But Ye's studio sessions are eccentric in more ways than just how the music's created. From start to finish, Kanye creates a whole aesthetic and feeling around each album that everyone involved is living. Here is Chris Rock talking about what he walked into during the My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy recording session. First of all, I, I hope he doesn't, you know, you know, Kanye get mad at you, then you get dissed on a record. But. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, I was just impressed. Like, first of all, everybody in the studio had suits on. Everybody. You're kidding me. I'm serious. Was that like a pre rec Yo, I thought he had like flown in a bunch of guys from like Europe or something, but like all the all the engineers and everybody was in like black suits and white white shirts and black tie like he he set up a mood right yeah. that when you walked in there you felt this mood that same thing happens today just with different vibes during the donda sessions everyone had to wear donda vests and matching merch according to five year foreign <laughs> you got studio rules when you in the studio yeah everybody gotta wear five year merch okay fire respectable <laughs> i learned that from yay i like that i mean we just went to yay shit he made us all wear like you had the vest on 
We got the vest on. He made us over with Don the merch. Shit. Yo, we on Don the timing. I guess to get us. Yeah. You know what I mean? Don the timing. Don the timing. Put everybody, you in the right. He gave everybody Yeezys. It's fire. Shh. Everyone got a pair of Yeezys? Yeezys, certain pants. No, he, this is what he do. It's like a uniform. He give us like Yeezys, some type of pants, some type okay. of cargo looking. It was like, black, yeah, black cargo. And then Don the shirts. That's what he do. Uniform. Uniform. It's uniform. So I guess, I guess it take away to like the egos. An artist and songwriter Casey told us in an interview that there were even daily Bible studies with a real pastor going on during the Donda sessions. Now you got five year porn, you got all these people we sitting down having Bible study. <laughs> and I felt like that was really like, that was key, you know? And here's Rizza talking about the focus and routine that Kanye had that inspired the whole room to create during the My Beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy time period. And, you know, I spent like two weeks out in Hawaii while he was working on his album and looking at his regimen. I'm going to share this with you. Maybe, I, maybe you know, I don't know if I got the authority to because it's his life, but I'm going to share it because this is a school academy where we share knowledge and somebody here will grab it and y'all will multiply it. I'm going to tell you something this young man does, y'all. They get up every morning and eat breakfast together, his whole crew. And they talk about yesterday and the next day and the day of and the present. They plan on over breakfast. They sit there and they talk about what they're going to do, what they did, and how to make the, the music better. Then they go exercise together. Okay, go to the YMCA, they play basketball, lift weights, focus, get the energy out, get the chi up. And then they hit the studio around four o'clock. First, he, well, first he would do some charity work. You know what I mean? Like invite all these kids and do some charity shit. So therefore, he's doing a good deed of the day as well. Good karma. And then he goes to the studio, and he stays there from four. And when I was there, we left at four, so twelve hours of in the studio work. Then go to bed, get up, and do it again the next day. According to Diplo, during the Watch the Throne sessions. Kanye even had Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen in there for this reason only. Also, I'm bringing Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen over too because they're like my thermometer for like what white girls listen to, I guess, which is what's the strange part of the whole thing. So Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen was there and I was sitting with this guy named Don Jazzy, he was like a Nigerian producer and he was just Twitter, Twitter going on, like trying to work on the beats, but he was just doing tweet, tweet stuff, even though I really wasn't doing anything good. I was kind of nervous. Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen's breathing down my neck. Kanye kept showing up. At one point he came with Kim Kardashian in there. And this is when she was still married to the guy that looked like Blake Griffin. Forgot his name. You know what I'm talking about? And um, and she was really pretty actually. I thought, this is, Kanye is such a cool guy. And yes, apparently this is a real story. I wonder what their first reaction was to hearing the line in the song. But that's not even the most Kanye thing that he did during that session. Apparently, Ye walked in and told the whole room this. Now, keep in mind, this was 2010 or 2011 at the latest. He like opens the door. I'm packing my bags up, trying to get out of there as fast as I can because I just I failed at this whole session. And he says, um, "Guys, I'm gonna marry Kim Kardashian. I'm gonna be president one day. I'm gonna be a fashion designer." The master manifester. Today, Kanye is renting out entire stadiums for the recording of his albums and switching up the order and the verses in real time in front of the world. But it seems like the motivation to create something that will impact people on a new level and elevate his artistic style is still the same. For Hip Hop DX, I'm Jeremy Hecht. Make sure you subscribe to the channel for more videos like this, daily news, artist interviews. Let us know who we should cover next in the comments and let us know in the comments what's the one Kanye studio session you would have liked to have been in the room for to witness. We'll leave you with one of the most inspirational speeches of all time, at least in my opinion. Peace. I know every, I know everybody asked me the question. They wanted to know what kind. I knew he's going to wild out and he's going to do something crazy. Everybody wanted to know what I would do if I didn't win. I guess we'll never know.